In chapter 7, we look at the numerical solution of ordinary differential equations. You've studied ordinary differential equations in your Math 231 class, but you were looking at analytical solutions to those equations. Now we're looking at cases where the analytical solution may not be available or too complicated to construct, and we like to numerically approximate what the solution to the equation looks like at different steps along the way. For example, if it's time variant. So we're going to start off with what are called initial value problems. And the representation of them will be very general in terms of multidimensional representations. So you will be seeing vector representations of differential equations like this, where y is not just one dimensional. It could be two, three, and four dimensions and higher. So we'll use the vector notation. But the description is looking at the derivative of that vector value, fu uh, of value function. And then a right-hand side that involves x and y in the first derivative of this right-hand side called f, itself being a vector value function. And then what we call an initial value specification for that particular vector at a, which would be equal to some other vector alpha. So that's a multidimensional representation. But we're going to start off with very simple 1D representations to make it easier. So for example, y prime equals f of xy. That means we're going to describe the behavior of a derivative of some unknown function y in terms of the independent variable x and y itself. It's called a first order differential equation because it involves the first derivative. So you could see that obviously if, if you just expand upon that, if it involved the second derivative, we would call it a second order differential equation and so forth. The meaning of the derivative in terms of the ratio of the, of the differentials is just like you had in your calculus classes. But the right-hand side of this equation, again, involves x and y. So we're describing a derivative. In physics, it might be we're describing a velocity, and our goal is to figure out position. It could be achieved by integrating. But the solution, there'd be a whole family of solutions that would describe, that could be described by the derivative, and they all be separated by a constant. The way to pick out a particular solution out of that family would be using an initial value that, for example, we want the case that initially y at some value of x being a is equal to alpha. So that picks out what we call a particular solution out of a whole family set of possible solutions described by a derivative. So that's the meaning of an initial value problem, the ability to select out a particular solution from a whole set of solutions which all solve or satisfy a, a derivative being a particular function f of x, y. So in general, for an order differential equation of order n, you're looking at something like this. So you're looking at the case of describing the nth order derivative as a function of the independent variable x the solution vector y, or the solution y, and all of its other derivatives below n. So it involves y prime, y double prime, and so forth. Now you can transform an nth order ODE into a set or a system of n first order equations by just making very simple variable substitutions, and then playing off the fact that we know the sequential relationship of derivatives, meaning the second derivative is the derivative of the first derivative. The third derivative is the derivative of the second derivative, and so forth. So if we start off by looking at substitutions like this, let's just suppose the original y, we say we call it y0, and we'll make a variable definition that will say y sub 1 is the first derivative, and y sub 2 is the second derivative, and so forth, so that the index is always matching the derivative. So y sub n minus 1 is the n minus first derivative. So if we make those variable substitutions and then exploit the relationship between derivatives, then y prime of, z of y0 would be what? y prime, but another name for y prime is y1. So now we have just a relationship between these two variables involving the first derivative. Similarly, y1 prime would be the same as the second derivative, and another name of the second derivative is y2. And we continue that pattern up till we get down to the derivative of y sub n minus 1, which must be equal to the nth derivative. And the nth derivative is given by the original equation. So what we've done is produce very simple 
first order ODEs up till the very end, where the last one is going to be more complicated because it involves the original ODE itself. All right, but the difference is, is notice that every row in this system only involves the first derivative, and so that's why that's called a system or a set of n first order differential equations. And all we did was make variable substitutions to achieve that. So when we do that, you extend the initial value problem itself that uh, you would have to evaluate all of those different uh, functions, y0, y1, y2, up through y minus 1 at a, and get back some particular value. And again, it's sort of a vector representation. But they all have to be specified at the same value, x equals a. But the, but the right-hand sides there could all be different. All those alpha zeros, ones, and twos, and so forth don't have to be the same. But, um, but they all have to be specified at that same value, value of x. Now we're going to be focusing on initial value problems in this discussion in this chapter, but you should know, uh, just for future references, that there's other sets of problems related to ODEs, and those are called boundary value problems. So initial value problems all involve relationships of the function and its derivatives at the same value. In other words, in this case, we're looking at describing y double prime is equal to minus y. That is a, that's a second order differential equation because it involves the second derivative. And we're specifying what the initial uh, solution, the, what the solution should be initially at zero, as well as the first derivative. You'll notice if it's a second order ODE, we need two conditions for it to be well posed. A BVP, or a boundary value problem, is a little bit different. It doesn't worry about specifying all the values of the lower derivatives. It only is interested in looking at more than one condition on the original solution, sort of at the boundaries, for example, in a region that you're integrating over. So that's the big difference. You'll notice that there's no derivative specification. We're just specifying two different uh, cases of what the solution might be two different times or two different boundaries and so forth. So those are called boundary value problems. We're not going to focus on none of those. The ones we're focusing in on this chapter will be initial value problems. So again, notation just to make sure we understand. We, we do use vector representations because it could be multi-dimensional. Y doesn't always have to be in one dimension. It could be a function of many variables, independent variables. So, um, so we'll use this notation y prime equals f prime x of y, where both f and y are vectors, and we specify the initial vector y at a, which could be equal to a vector alpha. And again, we can represent f prime of x of y in this particular form, where we specified, uh, we can write it as a, a set of n order differential equations like we did before with those variable substitutions. So it's just using some notation to describe that set of n first order equations that we had before. So we're going to start off with developing methods that will help us do this integration. In other words, get a way to describe what the solution must be doing if we know the behavior of the derivative. So that's the, that's the goal of differential, solving differential equations, is you know information about the derivative, and you're trying to figure out what the solution's doing. So Taylor series method is a very simple method. Um, it's, it's fairly good accuracy, uh, and it's based on Taylor series expansions. And now we're going to look at the Taylor series expansions for a vector y about the independent variable x. Again, where y could live in more than one dimension at a particular value of x. So what Taylor's series uh, expansions tell us is that if you want to move on to the point or the time x plus h, you can do that from your original representation of your vector, and, uh, but you're going to, uh, to do that, you'll need other derivative information. And so this sort of represents you know, the other terms in the expansion that would be needed um, to get you or to advance to approximate the representation of the vector at x plus h. And just notice it uses increasing powers of the step size h multiplied by um, the corresponding derivative, second derivative h squared, 
uh, with a constant 1 over 2 factorial and so forth. You can go all the way up in general to a form like this, to the nth order derivative times h to the m over m factorial. And if you stopped at this point, because this expansion will just keep going on, going on, then the truncation error, in other words, what's the error in terms of representing this expansion to the point at a time x plus h? This is what the error would be. It would involve the m plus first derivative evaluated at some interior point between x and x plus h, multiplied times h times to the m plus 1 power, and all that's divided by m plus 1 factorial. So the error is, is, you know, is determined by what the size of h is, as well as the behavior of the nth plus first derivative. How those high order derivatives are behaving will determine whether this error is going to be pretty large and your approximation is not that good, or it's a very relatively low error rate, uh, value and your approximation is good. So again, Taylor series is giving you a way of approximating what a function is going to be like at another point down the line. For example, we know what we have information about maybe y at the value x, and we're interested in knowing, well, what's it going to behave like at x plus h when we're giving derivative information? So if you remember from finding difference approximations, one way we could approximate the m plus first derivative in that error term that we just had is we could use a very simple uh, forward differencing there, and again, we're using information about the nth order derivative to estimate what uh, the m plus first order derivative would be. That's no different than we did before, where we might be approximating the first derivative using the function, okay? So what we're doing here is we're using the nth derivative to approximate the m plus first one with a very simple forward difference approximation, and the error would turn out to be something like this, where the error would be involving the differences between what those the nth derivative would be over m plus 1 factorial times h to the n. So what's cool with this method is now we have a way, as we keep adding more terms in the Taylor series expansion, we'll be able to see how that error is dropping. And when the error drops sufficiently low, we could stop the process and be happy with our approximation and then move on to another point, for example. So it's a way of stepping through different solutions, uh, values of the solution y, you know, starting off with an initial value that was given, which is what why they're called initial value problems. We have to know what the solution is at some point, and then we could use Taylor series to keep integrating through time or through along the x-axis. Um, but this would tell us how many terms we need to do that to get a certain uh, accuracy in terms of how large this error would be. So we'll look at an example on page uh, 7. Uh, this is example 7.1 on page 250 and 251. And, uh, and we know what the analytical solution of the ODE is, and we'll see how, that, how our numerical approximation to it um, varies with it. So this is going to be a first order uh, or ODE because it involves just the first derivative and the solution y itself and then has a quadratic term in x. So y prime plus 4y equals x squared and we have the initial value that the solution at 0 should be equal to 1. And our goal is to figure out what the solution is doing or what value represents y at 0 0.1 and we're to use a fourth order Taylor series method with a single in, in integration step. So when they say a single integration step, you know, our goal is we know what the solution is at zero, and we're trying to figure out what the solution is 0 0.1. So we're going to make one step. So the step size h here is just going to be 0 0.1. So you can take multiple steps if you want. You could start off with going to 0 0.05, and then jump to 0 0.1, and that would be a two-step integration. So if it's just a single integration step, it's just one rep, it's just one uh, use of Taylor series, okay, to get from zero to zero plus one. We'll estimate the error, and then we're going to compare with the actual error because the analytical solution to that ODE is given here. Okay, so meaning I can tell you what the solution is doing at any value of x, not just zero point one, because I have the analytical solution.
But the goal in this chapter is that, you know, maybe we don't have the analytical solution or it's not available. And I still want a reasonable estimate numerically of what the solution is doing. So the fourth order Taylor series method to achieve this integration would look something like this. In other words, we were given the initial condition of the solution at x equals zero. Right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to estimate it at a new value. In this case, we know what h is going to be, right? It's going to be 0 0.1. So we know that h is going to be 0 0.1. That's what we're asked to approximate. Is what is the solution at this value? The Taylor series expansion involves all of the derivatives up to, if it's a fourth order method, it goes up to, it includes the fourth derivative. So if it was a second order method, it wouldn't go up to the second derivative term and so forth. So that's the meaning of what order means in terms of a Taylor series method. So all we have to do is evaluate what y of h is. We really just want to know what y of 0 0.1 is. Um, and we have to keep in mind that all we were given initially for this problem is this information that the derivative y prime is equal to uh, if I just take that other term to the other side, x squared uh, minus 4y, or you could write it as minus 4y plus x squared. That's all we're given, okay? But we know the relationship to the derivatives. If I gave you the first derivative, which I just wrote here on the slide, then you can easily compute the second derivative because that would be the derivative of the first derivative. And so you can get the third derivative by taking the derivative of the second derivative, and you'll get the fourth one by taking the derivative of the third one. So you see the trick is to start off with the information you're given and be able to derive the remaining terms of the Taylor series expansion. Very, very straightforward. So for example, we have the original ODE that we were given. So if we want the second derivative, we would take the derivative of that, which would be minus 4y prime plus 2x, and then substitute the fact that we actually know, again, the description of what the first derivative is in terms of the original solution and x. And then if we plug that in, then what we can get is a representation of the second derivative that it only involves the solution y and different uh, expressions in x. Similarly, the third derivative is this derivative of the second derivative, which means we could take the derivative of this expression and again, clean it up a little bit, and now we have a representation of the third derivative that only involves the solution y, constant multiples times it, and an expression x. And then similarly, the fourth derivative is just the first derivative of that term. And so what I've got is a way of representing what each of those derivatives is going to be, right? We're trying to evaluate them all at zero, right? But I can do that because I have the initial condition, because I've described this problem in terms of when x is 0 and y is 0. So I can, therefore, plug them in to all these right-hand sides and get those values of the derivative. So, for example, you plug in the 0 for all those representations of the derivative, and out come all these values, minus 4, 16, minus 62, 248. I plug them all in into the corresponding components of the Taylor series expansion, and that is my estimate now of what the solution must be doing at y0.1, given the fact that I started off that y of 0 is equal to 1. So it has dropped. When you move to x is equal to 0.1, it's dropped from 1 down to 0.607. Use our error representation for Taylor series, which I've written up here. For the fourth order term, you would need to represent the error uh, using the formula that was on the previous slide for the error. And in this case, it would be h to the fourth over 5 factorial times y to the fourth over 0 0.1 minus y to the fourth derivative at 0. So those are the fourth derivatives evaluated 0 0.1 minus uh, the uh, fourth derivative at 0. So I just need to find the representation of what that error would look like. I already know that h is 0 0.1, so I can just plug that in. That's 5 factorial. And so 
I have a representation for what the fourth derivative at zero is, our initial condition. We already know that's 248. So we know that term is 248. What I've written over here is just saying that, well, I know how to evaluate the fourth derivative now because I computed it using the series of derivatives that I started with from the ODE. So all I need to do is just change how I evaluate it. Instead of evaluating at zero, I'll plug in 0 0.1 and uh, use the fact that I've already integrated and figured out that y of 0 0.1 is this value here. So that goes into this part of the equation. And then I'll have minus 64 times 0 0.1 squared plus 32 times 0 0.1 squared minus 8. So again, I have a general representation of what the fourth derivative is. It's just when I go in to plug in the value here, I'm going to plug in 0 0.1. And I'm going to have to use the fact that I've actually done an integration to figure out with one step what y of 0 0.1 is. And the rest of the terms will involve just multiplying 0 0.1 times you know, the, its powers and then the, those scalars. So if you compute this error here in the way I've indicated, uh, you would get something like minus 6.8 times 10 to the minus 5. So it's fairly small, all right? Not quite six decimal digits accuracy. Remember, if you go back, we know what the analytical, solu the analytical solution is because that you can get that from a 231 class. So the analytical solution evaluated at 0 0.1 would actually turn out to be 0 0.670623. So the actual error between what we have approximated here and what the analytical solution would be is about negative 0.7 times 10 to the minus 5. And you can see that our error estimate is almost negative, point, uh, seven, negative 7 times 10 to the minus 5. So this is actually a very, very good estimate. So this is a very good estimate for the errors. So that's one advantage of the Taylor series method is that as you take higher order methods using more derivatives, the accuracy will get pretty good. But the cost now is going to be that you have to evaluate the function y many, many more times. You noticed you had to evaluate it for every one of those der uh, derivative approximations.